Great. I'd first like to start by acknowledging uh, my collaborators and co-authors. So Keith Hall and Lowell Diller, also associated with Green Diamond Resource Company, and Keith Slauson and Bill Zwinski with Pacific Southwest Research Station. And all the boots on the ground, there have been many, uh, so all the field crews past and present. So first I'm going to breeze through a little bit of background information just to set the stage. So this is the historical distribution of Pacific Martins. So to the east we have Sierra Martin, and in the west we have Humboldt Martin. And the Humboldt Martin was completely extirpated, or thought to be completely extirpated from its historic range until a remnant population was rediscovered in kind of that red bubble uh, about 1996 on Six Rivers National Forest. So we're going to zoom in there. So Six Rivers National Forest, Forest Service property, it's a little bit hard to tell. We've had some technical difficulties with the projector, but the darker shaded areas kind of to the east, uh, that Forest Service, and then kind of the white areas more to the west, those are managed lands. And 2000, 2001, the area was surveyed for Martin, so all the circles. The dark circles, the black circles, those were in Martin were detected. So you can see the majority of those detections occurred on Forest Service. So only two occurred on the managed lands. There really wasn't a lot going on on those managed lands to the west, so let's talk about those. One of the primary ownerships um, in that area was Green Diamond Resource Company. This is the current ownership map for Green Diamond. The property as far south as Rio Dell and as far north as the California-Oregon border. It's about 360,000 acres, and it can be described as uh, even age management, so clear cutting with a short rotation, 40, 60 years, and it's relatively young, so we're talking second growth and third growth habitats. Now, although it's been managed, there's been this trend towards increasing retention of structure. So I'm going to just set the stage for a minute there. We're starting off with the California Forest Practice Rules, and if anybody in this room is familiar with those regulations, it's already a pretty high standard compared to other states, so starting out with a good foundation. In 1992, Green Diamond adopted a northern spotted owl habitat conservation plan, so that added protection for spotted owl habitat. It's been updated along the way, but went through a major amendment in 2007. Again, more emphasis on habitat retention. And then in the late 90s, Green Diamond um, adopted a volunteer program called the Terrestrial Deadwood Management Plan. And this was a collaborative effort between Green Diamond and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as CAL FIRE. And its goal is to try to standardize the type of retention occurring across the landscape. So standardize it for biologists, foresters, and regulators. So key components, uh, this document allowed for the retention of green trees in clear cuts, uh, retention of snags, and retention of large downwoody debris. Another key component, was this wildlife leaf tree program. So retaining trees that have these features that are valuable to wildlife, rare in the landscape, and hard to grow. So cavities, complex crowns or other structures, basal hollows, get the idea. More recently, Green Diamond adopted an aquatic habitat conservation plan in 2006. And all this was focused towards aquatic resources. It added extra habitat protection along riparian zones, which is also important for terrestrial species. So now we've developed this landscape that although it's managed, there's been this trend of increasing uh, retention of these structures that are valuable to wildlife. So we're finding those features that are valuable to wildlife being utilized and important for spotted owls and other species like Fisher. 1994 and 1995, Green Diamond surveyed the entire ownership using track plates. They were looking for Fisher. They found a lot of Fisher, and at the time, no Martin. Surveyed again 2004, 2006, still a lot of Fisher, but they also detected Martin. So little red pluses, which I'm going to zoom into. And again, colors are going to show up a little funky on this map. Might be better on that one. But at the top right, that's Forest Service. And so that's where the remnant population of Martin was rediscovered. And then just below that, kind of showing up a little bit brownish on this one. Um, that is currently being managed by the Yurok tribe. But up until 2008, that was owned and managed by Green Diamond. And then the current Green Diamond ownership in that pinkish purple color to the west. Uh, the major watercourse running north-south, that's the Klamath River. Major watercourse east to west, that's Blue Creek. And again, all those red pluses were where they detected Martin. All right. We surveyed, so surveyed again using cameras, 2010, 2011, and again detected Martin. So those are all kind of pink-colored stars. So we started detecting Martin in this area somewhat consistently, but we really weren't sure what was going on. Uh, so we teamed up with uh, RSL, Yurok Tribe, and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to try to figure out what Martin were doing on this managed landscape. The initial goal, the initial study was really focused on dispersal ecologies. So we were focused on younger individuals. We established uh, a camera transect, all those green triangles, and uh, where we detected them, like we did, the cameras, we had placed out traps. All trapped individuals were processed and radio marked. 
So the initial project, that dispersal ecology study, was only supposed to go from 2012 through 2014. But we found all these other great opportunities along the way, so we are still um, studying in, in this area. So again, all these opportunistic objectives were added on. So in total, from 2012 through present, we have captured 33 individuals, 15 are female. We've radiomarked 24 of those 11 were female. And countless other unmarked individuals, either through trapping, maybe they were pit tagged but not radiomarked, and then others on the, on the remote cameras. So these are those opportunistic objectives. These were added on in 2014 when the project was supposed to be wrapped up. We kept going with whatever animals were currently collared at the time. Uh, so we wanted to really look at rest and den sites. We wanted to look at what those structures looked like, what were the stand characteristics around those structures, could we tell differences from natal and maternal den use, site fidelity, uh, was reproduction happening, and if so, how many kits were the females producing? And anything else about the timing of denning? So first off, just a couple of quick definitions. Natal den, that's the site where the female is actually giving birth to kits. Maternal den, those are the dens used after the natal den, and it's really important to document kits at these structures to be able to distinguish them from rest sites. What we do is we track these females starting late February and early March intensively through telemetry. And then we started seeing that they would localize their movements in an area, and if we saw them using uh, the same structure, or tree, or other structure repeatedly, then we would place out remote cameras in hopes of capturing additional behavior of the female and hopefully kits. So in total 2012 to present, we've collected more than 2,000 telemetry locations, uh, so male and female, 150 rest sites, and of those, 34 have been confirmed as dens. So what else are we seeing? So we're seeing that females start to localize their movements mid-March through early April. And that second line is kind of a typo. It should be earliest potential den. It was March 17th. So that's really just indicating when we've seen the earliest time a female started to localize movements. Uh, the earliest confirmation of kits, we actually photographed a kit, uh, was April 9th. So if you kind of piece this information together, we're right in line with all the other studies. Uh, females are likely giving birth late March and through early April. What are they using for den structures? So you can see from this graph on the far left, they're using live trees. So really important. But we're also finding them in snags, uh, log and rock piles, and a couple occasions in these artificial rest boxes. And those were deployed as part of another collaborative project between HSU, a master's student, and Redwood Science Lab. And we also have one female that denned underground. So what are they using on these structures? Again, cavities. So cavities are really important for, for denning females. They're using other structures on those trees, but the number one feature was cavities. What else are we saying about these den structures? So for live trees and snags, we're noticing that those are the larger features on the landscape. So larger diameter trees, on average about three foot dBH. And you can see those two, um, the two photos are confirmed dens, and you can see that they, they stick out. They are, they are larger than the things around them. But we're also noticing that they are the more complex features out there. So all those features I talked about earlier with that wildlife leave tree program, these are the features that we're finding on these den structures. So complex tops, complex branching, cavities, basal hollows. These are a few thick pictures just to give you an idea. These are the confirmed dens. Um, you can see this first picture, lots of cavities up and down the trunk of the tree. Again, more complex branch structure, broken branches, limbs. In a large cavity at the top with the females on the edge of. There's also a bigger tree on the landscape. Again, riddled with cavities. Um, and again, complex structure. Complex structure. Uh, this basal hollow actually um, extended up further into the trunk of the tree with the cavity. And you can see the female is actually poking her head out in the top right and her kit um, bottom right. So the location of these dens. Um, so we've actually kind of found the whole, um, the whole scale possible. So underground all the way to the very top of uh, some of these trees. So this slide just kind of shows the ones that are closer to the ground, so those that are at ground level or within a couple of feet. And then this slide shows um, about eye level to the ones that are a little bit higher on, on, the, on the structures. Some other kind of anomalies or I guess things that we were surprised about. Um, we found that some dens were located with, in close proximity to um, man-made edges or openings. Uh, so the range would be about 20 feet, um, and then other females were denning pretty far away, uh, as far away as you can get on a managed landscape from those man-made openings, about 2,000 feet. And in the photo, there are two dens 
from a female on one of her dens who's located at the bottom right star. It uh, was located about 35 feet from a main line logging road. And then the other den in the top left was about 40 feet from a recent clear cut. This is an example of female five and her den sites. So we monitored her only in 2014 and 2015. 2014, she produced one kit, 2015, two. We confirmed nine dens total, so all the red stars. And those colored polygons are uh, recent harvest units, so clear cutting from about 2003 to 2008. And again, she has kind of a mix. So you can see some of her den sites are located right on the edges of some of those man-made openings, and others aren't. Some are located right on the edges of mainline roads. Others are kind of maybe drivable roads, but not necessarily main traffic routes. Um, her den to the far east, to the far right of the slide, that was actually on forest service in old growth. And then the rest were in this matrix of 20 to 90 year old stands, so just again a mix. All of her dens were, in, were cavities in live trees or snags except for two. Um, this middle one was actually a rock pile, so it's kind of just right there on the edge of this hairpin turn for the, like, the main artery going through this watershed, that main road. And then her other den that wasn't in a live tree or snag was uh, the one on Forest Service. It's actually the female that, that den underground. So starting with reproduction, so if we combine all years of the study, um, females we monitor, we monitor females are at least one year old for a total of 16 females. And of those 16 females, 75% oh, at least attempted reproduction. And of the ones that attempted reproduction, all but one was successful. So all but one failed to produce at least one kit. And that female, uh, we monitored her and by all of her kind of behavioral characteristics appeared to be denning. Uh, she was even using some den sites from a previous year, but we just were never able to capture kits um, on, on the camera. So it's kind of unclear if she um, reproduced and we missed it or if she, she failed early on. And as far as kit production, out of the 12 reproductive attempts, we documented a minimum of 20 kits, so kits produced. And of those, we, con we confirmed at least 17 made it to what we considered weaned, and that was just photographing them late August or through September. And so you can see in 2014, we know at least one, ki one kit did not make it to independence, and that was because that female died early on in the denning season. She was killed by a bobcat. And that's a photo on the um, bottom left of a bobcat climbing a den tree. Likewise, a female in, in 2016 documented with two kits. She died before those kits um, were able to make it to um, independence. Um, that necropsy is pending. But overall, again, 12 reproductive attempts produced a minimum of 17 wean kits. Other trends we're noticing, females that attempted reproduction were at least two years of age, but the majority were older. Females less than two years of age didn't even attempt to reproduce, and that is right in line with other studies. Successful females produced an average of 1.8 kits per female per year. Can't really have part of a kit, so probably a better way of looking at that is the majority produced at least two kits in a year. Um, the range was one to three. So den site fidelity, you notice that 60% of the females reused a den within the same season. 50% of the females reused a den from a previous season. So we had some females that didn't reuse any dens, at least not that we could document, and that others did. So looking at female four as our example, we monitored female four in all three years of the study. She produced kits in all three years. And we were able to document nine dens for her. And of those, six were unique. So um, in 2014, she reused a maternal den twice during the denning season. So that's a, um, a case of reuse within a season. And she also, in all three years, used the exact same natal den. So that's also documenting uh, use from a previous season. And then again, in 2015, we did confirm that she reused um, her natal den later in the denning season as a maternal den. So um, again, we had some females reusing dens and others not. Um, this is the part of the presentation I like to call gee whiz. So what we found, um, this is a slash pile in about a five to 10 year old clear cut um, surrounded by some older um, stands. And we did document both male and female resting in these slash piles. We never confirmed denning. We had a couple potential den sites, but again, never confirmed kits. But we did confirm that females would use these slash piles as rest sites during the denning season. So they would leave their kits at the den and then go, in one case, we had a female kind of foraging in one of these clear cuts for a while, and then she would periodically kind of just stop, almost like a stopover, um, at, these, at these slash piles and rest there, and then go back to the den site. 
Again, these weren't baited stations. These were just cameras placed at where we thought a likely entrance or exit to the den existed in hopes of capturing a picture of a female or maybe kits. We also had not only a lot of other predator species that, on these cameras, but you can see a suite of prey items. So small mammals, birds, and in the top picture, that's a kit poking its head out, and in the exact same cavity, you get a deer mouth. Uh, we also are fortunate to capture pictures of females delivering prey items back to the den. And a lot of times you can't really tell what they're bringing. Um, based on the photo series, my best guess, the top left is some kind of squirrel. Um, the top right, you kind of get a glimpse of a bird wing. Bottom right, some kind of small mammal the size of a chipmunk. And the bottom left, some kind of fungus. This one, hopefully we can all agree, um, female five delivered a mole to the den tree. And you can see the kits just went to town. All right, so uh, next steps. Obviously, I think there's a lot of data that we can continue to collect, um, so I think we should. Uh, I think we have a, a great opportunity to figure out what Martin are, are doing on this managed landscape and how that might translate to other managed lands. More importantly, um, to kind of echo things Emily said in her opening statements, we need to analyze the data we already have and publish it. We've analyzed very little of this data and published none of it since 2012, so we need to get on the ball there. Um, but definitely continue to collect information. I hope one of those areas will be use versus availability. I think that's very important, especially for a managed landscape. But so far what we found I think is really encouraging. We're not only documenting Martin occupying a managed landscape, but they're reproducing successfully there. And the structures that they're utilizing, we've already found are important for other species that we're monitoring, so spotted owls, fisher, and other species. And it's not just green diamond um, with with strong efforts to retain those structures as other landowners as well, small and large. So to me, that's also very encouraging for the future conservation of Martin, managed landscape, but also hopefully um, the path towards recovery. There you Um, I'm curious if you have a sense from the data that you collected about, I'm fascinated by the distribution of the dead site, spanning maze, all roads, you know, all the way to old growth. Um, and it seems like there's so many factors that could be behind it. I mean, do you think foraging range is, is an issue? Um, do you have a sense of how many of those occupied dead sites versus how many potential dead sites there could be? Great question. So that is one thing I hope we'll look at. We, we, we don't have any current data on, again, that use versus availability, so what we documented versus what's actually out there. Um, but I, at least anecdotally or the initial data, the raw data, they're using, I think, a variety, um, whether it's close proximity to, to openings um, or as far as they can get on a managed landscape away from those openings. So hopefully when we delve into the analysis part, we'll maybe see some statistical significance but maybe we won't. Um, the pattern I'm seeing most with the data is that the limiting feature does seem to be those reproductive structures, those, those den sites, and I think that's echoed in a lot of other studies and, and literature, not just for Martin, but other, other mammals. And what we've seen with, with spotted owls and fisher, you know, the reproductive structures seem to be very important, and then you can find them in a variety of habitats as long as that reproductive structure is there. So I'm hopeful that that's what we'll be um, seeing with Martin. Brad. Um, I'm just curious, the number of dead sites per female, is that a minimum number or Great question. Great question. We did not get all the densites for every female. Uh, as you can imagine, it's very difficult, um, even just through telemetry, to figure out what structure they're in, especially if you have two structures really close together. Um, so a lot of times we would, uh, we would just know a female was here denning in, some, in one of these few trees. Um, other times we, we wouldn't relocate them in time before they moved to maybe a second, uh, second or third den site. So I would say that's definitely a minimum number of dens. And we also want to be able to confirm females moving in and out of those trees, either with telemetry or the cameras. And you can also imagine placing cameras at just the right spot. Even if you're putting out multiple, you're going to still miss some females. They a lot of times would hop to other trees before coming down. So even though we had the right den tree, we completely miss where they were coming. Uh, coming and going. What percentage of the trees that were den sites um, um, met your retention standards? Great question. Um, so if you if you look at not the repeated use, but just the total tree and snag, there's about 24. And um, we only had data for 23 of them, and all 23 scored with just the tree elements. There's other things um, that that program would apply as far as how scarce they are at a harvest unit level, how scarce they are at a watershed, and we didn't take that into consideration. It was just 
those features on the trees and they all scored high enough to be retained, except for the one, again, we just didn't have data for.